Moving the needle on founder failure, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Lucas Poles, and welcome to Startup 2.0 by Spark XYZ. Join us each week as we give you access to some of the top investors and entrepreneurs around the country to help you think through and overcome some of the top challenges that startups face. I, I think there's no better place in the country to be investing than Los Angeles. What is the problem that you're solving and for who? Like, what is that specific pain point? Sometimes when a company is not listening to its customers and just thinks it knows better than its customers, has a really, really hard time finding product market fit. I want to see somebody that that isn't going to stop. You know, this person, you just feel like they're going to, they're going to, they're going to make it work. Big heartfelt thank you to Brex, who without their support, this show would not be possible. We've seen firsthand the difficulties accessing basic corporate credit without providing a security deposit or personal guarantee early on. As companies grow, managing expenses has become more difficult and time consuming, which is why we've partnered with Brex to offer a corporate credit card that is not personally guaranteed, offers higher credit limits, provides auto reconciliation, and integrates with ERPs using receipt capture. Brex is the credit card of the startup ecosystem, and we highly encourage you to check them out. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And so where we traditionally like to uh, start is want to find out a little bit more about the firm, um, what you guys do, kind of model, all that kind of fun stuff. Sure. So Fusion LA, uh, it's an accelerator program based here in uh, Santa Monica. Uh, we're a small shop. It's me and my co-founder, a guy who's uh, typically based in Tel Aviv and spending significant time here in California. Um, we invest in Israeli-led startups uh, and we launched a firm three years ago. Uh, this September, uh, it's exactly three years since our first uh, investment. And over the course of the last three years, we've done 43 deals. Hopefully by this September, we'll actually hit uh, 50. Um, all pre-seed investments, Initially, our check size was uh, uh, was more modest, 20, 50K. And, uh, and now we're glad in the last year that we're able to cut larger checks. And each company that participate in, in our accelerator program uh, gets $110,000 nice. plus the program itself, which is a two, three month intense uh, mentorship program uh, that, you know, very similar to uh, programs that you you know uh, locally uh, from uh, uh, Textras and 500 Startups and YC. It's a structured, uh, the idea is to help the founders uh, create a network uh, with local executives, investors, and people that could help them scale the business in the U.S. Awesome. So you're helping a lot of, uh, with a lot of the Israeli startups, you're helping them kind of break into the U.S. market as well, right? Yeah, that's, that's the vision. The vision is really help connect between the ecosystem and Israel, um, which is, I think, after the U.S. per capita, uh, one of the you know, more, more, most thriving ecosystems uh, in the world for uh, innovation mm -hmm. uh, and kind of like help those companies set up a shop. Israel is a small country. 9 million people, so LA County is larger. Uh, in, in most Israeli startups think globally from day one. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and think about how to engage with US clients. Uh, and, part, and a big part of the program is helping them create a network uh, more on, on the business side of things and kind of like how to engage clients, create an advisory board, um, and, and position the company uh, to be able to raise institutional round from U.S. investors. Awesome. So obviously, COVID is uh, one of the big things on top of mind for a lot of founders, uh, especially right now. So um, I'm curious to know from an investor standpoint, like how how has the transition been? Because accelerators are traditionally very hands-on, very in-person, right? Very like high-touch oriented. Um, oh, uh, this this situation uh, uh, caught us in the midst of of, uh, of a batch that yeah. we had here in Santa Monica. So we ate, uh, we had seven companies arriving here late February. Uh, as part of the program, we also rent for the founders uh, housing here for two months, and they work from our offices. And most of the meetings is about establishing that personal relationship with uh, local individuals. Uh, and we had to move everything to, to Zoom. Um, one thing 
I think we, we were successful to moving everything to Zoom because investors and entrepreneurs, everybody were in the same boat and we're happy to take a call in this weird times, everybody you know, working from home. Um, so they've done that. But I think the real struggle is to actually create a significant business traction during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, sell, especially if you're a B2B business. Um, it's hard because uh, a lot of companies just uh, were playing defense or on hold and, and not really as excited working together with a company from across the ocean uh, and like spending that extra budget on an, a startup. And I think all startups face the same struggle right now. Uh, we're working also with startups that are in the direct to consumer and uh, space as well. Uh, so for those startups, it was actually an opportunity, but about two thirds of our portfolio is B2B uh, and some of our alumni, of course, uh, facing, um, you know, challenges and in, in revenue that they've expected <coughs> to receive this year, they had to adjust. Um, for the gaming companies we've worked with, that has been uh, uh, an opportunity uh, yeah. uh, for sure. And, and, uh, and, uh, and again, direct to consumer. So um, it's, it's case by case, it's, it's different for each of our portfolio companies. Uh, but for us as an accelerator, um, even trying to plan for the next batch that we're, we're typically doing a batch in March and in September, just trying to understand how, how things will, will work this fall. And if we'll, uh, we'll do something hybrid, kind of like virtual and in person, or actually we'll go full, full virtual and only when things will uh, open up, kind of like bring the guys here. Um, those are things we're still debating. Yeah, no, understandable. I mean, uh, finding out what the world's going to be like in September is a uh, yeah, uh, magic eight ball right now, trying to figure it out. So, <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, and it's about uh, having a vaccine in the market or not. Uh, but even, uh, you know, the little stuff like trade shows and the fact that many of the conferences were just canceled until the end of the year, all of them uh, poses a real significant uh, challenge. And nobody really cracked uh, we spoke about it in a separate call, like how to do networking professionally yeah. in uh, in using just Zoom. It's not it's not a solution or other forms. Nobody really cracked that, and uh, maybe it's a company to invest in. Yeah, yeah. if I find that company, I will absolutely be putting capital in. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, so let's walk through a little bit more about uh, the portfolio companies you have invested in um, and kind of what you look for going forward. So walk me through, and you, you walk through a little bit about your portfolio, some of it being B2B, some of it being uh, direct to consumer. So walk me through kind of your investment thesis. Like what, what are you typically looking for uh, when you're looking at applications? So the, the short answer that we're looking for a solid team. Um, uh, our like precondition um, for like uh, we'll take it we'll take a call and we'll we'll meet pretty much any founder that reach out to us uh, that fill out our application form on 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 our website uh, pretty standard and we've actually announced uh, just two weeks ago that we're gonna do all the process of interviewing companies. Uh, in three weeks and have it uh, transparent for the founders that apply. Mm -hmm. And in three weeks, you'll get a, a note even before if we're moving forward for a term sheet or we're gonna table the conversation and happy to speak uh, <clears throat> maybe in six months or like uh, uh, later in the year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in terms of, of the process, but you have, you've asked about what we're looking for. Uh, so it's a solid team typically two or more uh, members of the founding uh, team that are fully committed to the venture. Mm -hmm. One of the founding team members uh, have to have, uh, to have technical capabilities or a full-time CTO. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's important to us to have that tech lead uh, in, in the team. Yeah. Um, and, if we're, and we've done deals both B2B and B2C. I think in Israel we see more B two B in terms of in terms of deals. 
Uh, I think it's also because Israel is so far away from the target market here. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, we see more uh, B2C, especially in the, in the gaming space. If it's a B2B company, we want to have them already build something. It's great if they already have clients mm -hmm. and, some, and we've made investments in companies that already have clients. But even if they don't have paying clients, we, wanna, we want them to be in a stage in which we call, them, we call it something to show. Like they've built something and they can start implementation with local clients here. Mm -hmm. And if it's B2C businesses, uh, like a gaming company or an esports platform, uh, we want them to be able to launch the product during the program. So if they're coming to us and they're saying, guys, uh, we've built something and we're able to launch this direct-to-consumer app game product in September, so let's do it. Or even better, if they have some first tests and we can look at the alpha. Um, so that's in terms of uh, you know product, but we come very early. Most of the companies we could be even first check in uh, in many of the deals. In others, we'll join, we'll like we'll participate or we'll come just just after friends and family, maybe a small institutional round up to a million dollars, something like that. Awesome. So I, I want to jump back to one of the things that you had said earlier. So your, your new process is that, and this is not typical for accelerators because accelerators usually have like a three month process for uh, application. So <laughs> why did you decide A, to narrow it down uh, to three weeks or under? And then uh, what has been the response so far from some of the founders? So that was uh, uh, typically what we, we would have done in previous uh, times. We would have uh, had a longer process of two, three months mm -hmm. of accepting applications with deadlines. Yeah. And then uh, kind of like uh, towards the end of the summer, if we were starting in, in September, we would have sent a bulk of term sheets and start negotiating deals. Yeah. Uh, we... We now started to do that on a, on a rolling basis. Um, and kind of like, once you file an application, we'll review it and three weeks later, you'll get an answer. Um, and, and the idea was to be as founder friendly as possible right now, because a lot of firms or a lot of investors are out there and saying that they're open to business. Uh, when in fact, uh, they are open and, 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 um, and, and they're looking at deals, but they'll be much more cautious right now. Yeah. Uh, and some of them uh, really are excited about meeting, meeting new founders, but I don't think we'll de they'll deploy cash um, or, or checks until Q4 or even Q1 of 2021 in new deals uh, because they're just like waiting to see uh, uh, what's going to be the situation. So, right. Uh, and we've been inspired by also uh, other firms that have done it here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, NFX uh, have done uh, a similar process for seed investments. Uh, our own uh, LP, um, Go Ahead Ventures in the Bay Area, um, also running quick process uh, of like three weeks and kind of like being transparent with the founders. Uh, and so far, just in two weeks, we've got over 100 applicants which is uh, great. Yeah. Uh, wow. so, so in a way, we're actually thinking it's going to be even more effective to us to work on a rolling basis. Um, and we're also doing everything remotely and over Zoom and created a back office to automate our emails and, and scheduling meetings. Uh, so we're trying to become more efficient. Previously, we hosted very long in-person uh, screening days in offices in Israel. Yeah. And um, we just think, uh, let's try to be uh, smarter. Also, us as a, as a VC, as a fund, let's try to be uh, more agile, work quicker. Um, and maybe after this uh, test, we'll, uh, we'll do that uh, moving forward. Nice. Awesome. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, not something easy to, uh, to do, go through our applications in <laughs> that amount of time. But uh, nice work, honestly. Um, Awesome. So as you're going through the process, I'm sure that you end up running into, uh, like not everyone out of the hundred people that have applied are going to make it. <laughs> so no, the, the idea is to cut, uh, <laughs> let's say seven, eight checks in the next two months. Cool. So 
from our perspective, so walk me through a little bit about that process. So what are maybe some of the red flags that you end up seeing that founders are making mistakes? Like what, what is something that you automatically see and you're like, oh, like uh, I'm not, uh, this, is, this is not a deal for me. Um, so I think a, a one red, red flag is uh, commitment of the founding team. Mm. Uh, if you, in the conversation, uh, realize that, uh, let's say you're speaking with the CEO uh, and, uh, and, and that person tells you that the CTO is not fully committed to the venture or is already working in another job. Uh, so it's hard, it's hard for us uh, because if you don't have a fully committed team and you're all into that, it's already very difficult to build a startup company. Yeah. Um, so it's very important to us to see uh, the two, three first uh, employees, uh, founders, fully committed to the venture. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Another thing is to see a team that has worked on the product for, uh, uh, let's say, six months or a year uh, and still didn't engage any clients. Uh, we really think that um, you need to engage with the clients as fast as possible. And many times Israeli founders, maybe also U.S. founders, they're in love with their product. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a moment you need to engage with client and it's sooner than later. Uh, and I, we think that business uh, should drive where the product uh, works. Uh, and goes and, and uh, uh, that's a common mistake. It's not a big no-no. It's not a red flag because wow. we meet we meet founders like that all the time. Uh, but we want them to be able to articulate the business need of uh, of uh, of their venture. And especially if they're coming from Israel, they need to have they need to have uh, an ability to tell you how they see the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. uh, competitors or or a little or just like think through how they're going to engage uh, clients and even if and if they spoke or made their market research it's great but when an entrepreneur uh, might tell you in a conversation that uh, he, uh, he or she didn't make those phone calls or emails to prospect uh, to prospect clients yeah. in the US and maybe just spoke with their family and friends or people close to them, uh, it's a red flag because you're, you want to have founders to invest in that can think globally and think big. Um, and those are the founders that will be able to raise capital and, and, and move uh, and grow their businesses here. I think something that is unique about our uh, model is that we really believe that in order to be a big successful company, uh, you need to have presence in the U.S. Uh, so one, we really, uh, part of the conversation is having those founders think about relocation to the U S mm -hmm. uh, even one team member, uh, uh, typically the R and D center stays in Israel, but they need to be open-minded to the fact that they're going to spend significant time, uh, by themselves sometimes, many times with the family also, uh, when the company progress, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, uh, and that's a big, big part of, of that entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, 100%. So let's dive back uh, uh, to something that you had said that uh, the commitment of the actual founders. So um, that's only probably the uh, second time recently that I've heard something like that. And something that the, uh, do you have any specific processes for seeing their actual commitment rather than just being actual full time to? The venture like do you have any other techniques and I'll, I'll give you an example so um, someone else that we've had on the show recently what they end up doing is uh, they actually they walk through their specific resume and they'll see how long they've stayed at other jobs uh, to see how long they think that they'd actually end up staying at the venture if it's someone that's been jumping around every six months so like this is probably not worth it because they're not going to uh, be here in six months <laughs> so are there any specific techniques that you look at for trying to determine uh, so how, how committed funny, they are? Funny you're, 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 you're talking about that, like uh, something we started implementing uh, just in the last batch. So I wouldn't yeah. say we've done it uh, uh, ever since we, 
we've started, but we started collecting data uh, on the background of the founding team members. And as part of the, pro uh, the, the process, in between the diligence calls we're doing, we're sending them another deep dive uh, questionnaires for mm -hmm. each member of the founding team members, kind of like also going through, uh, you know, the resume uh, and as well as also, uh, no universities, but also uh, military service. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, um, and also uh, how many, if they've been involved in other companies before, mm -hmm. um, as founding team members in startups. So we're collecting that data um, it's, uh, it's still not in, in, a, in a capacity uh, that we're um, making decisions just off that data. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully, uh, as we grow and we'll collect data now on 50 portfolio companies or, and, 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 and it's going to grow to 100 portfolio companies, yeah. and then we'll have some success stories, we could look back into that. So those are, those are things that we're trying to, to build the infrastructure for them uh, right now yeah. uh, in terms of uh, founders data. Um, and jumping on, on a call, not just, take, not just speak with the CEO, but also jumping on a call with the CTO. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> and CTOs tend to tell you a different story than the CEOs. Yes. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll find some interesting stuff. When you speak with CTOs, I'm not going to get into details, but we had, you know, we had even one funny conversation. I think it was a year and a half ago that we spoke with the CEO and then we jumped on a call with the CTO and we've heard uh, lack of commitment from the CTO. Uh, like the CTO was speaking about the CEO and, and telling us that he is probably looking for another job. And that was, that's an extreme thing that happened in our diligence process. But that's uh, one thing that was uh, was really red red flag. But typically, you know, you want to get you want to you have the feeling from other team members that's extreme uh, and, and a funny story. But uh, but but just like hearing from the CTO, what do they think? Where the product is really is? It's never ready. But kind of like understand how they how they see things. Yeah, understandable. Something else they mentioned that I always find uh, interesting is. And typically, honestly, I end up seeing it more with all engineering teams rather than uh, either uh, non-homogeneous teams or like uh, like a true CEO CTO. Um, with not getting the product out into uh, market, it, it is something that we typically run into. It's like, look, it doesn't matter if it's crap; like, it it needs to get out because if you you have no idea what. Uh, what is actually going to happen until a customer actually puts it in their hands. And if it's exciting and there are just additional features that you need to build, like, great. Like that's exciting. Like you have some type of traction to be able to show and you can fix the solution uh, appropriate, but yeah, there's a lot of time you run into people and they're like, Oh yeah, I've been working on this for a year. I haven't had anyone test it. You're like, Oh, do you know what you're building? Like, do, are you actually building the right thing that customers specifically want? So uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great point. Um, so for, uh, let's talk about like early stage for founders. So maybe some of the founders that are actually in your actual cohort. So uh, maybe early uh, in the cohort, maybe early after, like what are, what are some of the mistakes that you see end up, that end up happening for early stage founders? Like mistakes that they end up making that are generally avoidable, but maybe lack of knowledge or just uh, true desire or like discipline within it to, to make sure that something went uh, differently? Like what, what are some of the mistakes that you see early on? You know, we're, we're um, as an accelerator and my, my perspective, it's all about building a uh, long sustainable relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And, and I think uh, just looking at the founders that were more successful, uh, in from our portfolio that those were the founders that were persistent um and also you saw that they they were able to articulate to their network um over the course of time uh their status and share and get feedback from 
from from their peers, uh, and and you can do that by sending uh, a monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly email update, mm -hmm. but also by by maintaining those relationships with people that they've met in the pro program. Mm -hmm. And a mistake that I think many founders uh, um, or some founders do is that they've met somebody uh, in, and, and, they should, and they didn't follow up. They didn't follow up quickly uh, and they didn't put an emphasis on keeping people in the loop no. uh, because it's a long journey. And once you, you know, kept people in the loop, when you have a good momentum, it's great. Everybody want to be part of that ride. Yeah. But things will go, yeah. will go in different directions. <laughs> and then you want to have people that have, have been with you and not just reach out back to somebody that you've met a year ago and they didn't hear back from you. So yeah. I think that's something that uh, just being aware of that. Um, and that's a big thing that we're trying to push our founders in the accelerator kind of like be, be transparent and maintain this network of relationships with people. It's hard to uh, write those updates, yeah. but it's important. Uh, it's important and I think it, it makes a big difference. Also when you're gonna go to ask uh, for money down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and for many right now, it's not a good time to raise money, as I mentioned before. But if a year from now you're gonna go and raise money, you wanna make, people aware of your progress, uh, even if it's small little things yeah. uh, that you've done. Uh, so that's a big takeaway, I think, from, for our portfolio. And I think a mistake that I see very common is, is, not, uh, is not keeping people in the loop. Uh, in early stage, I think you know, personal relationships uh, mean a lot. As, and the same way we do business with people that we believe in, uh, I think other you know, seed investors, and even clients, they, they want to do business with people uh, that they trust. Um, and, and creating that trust is a big challenge. And it needs, it needs, um, you need discipline to, to do that. Yeah, I 100% agree. A lot of time it's the small things that uh, mean the world for, uh, for growing house. Um, awesome. Uh, what I think is, we're just going back to the beginning part. Uh, everyone is, you know, when you talk about the, the other, everyone in the ecosystem right now, that it's, it's so interesting because everyone says that they're writing checks, but like not a minute, a lot of people are actually going out and writing checks, like which I, I, I no, so, some investors are, are actually open about it. And I've heard uh, in different webinars right now, uh, investors, even from big funds like Bessemer and others that are saying, guys, we're in the next quarter, we're probably going to write checks, but it's going to be for our own portfolio companies Yeah, uh, because we want to help uh, kind of like uh, protect our investment and have them in, uh, have those companies uh, go through 2020, 2021 and, and get to that point. And I get that. Uh, and I think, um, it's uh, there's a lot, a lot of uncertainty. The public markets are one thing, but when you go, but when you go here, even in like Santa Monica, uh, Third Street, Abu Tkini, although things should have been opened up yeah. or like are allowed to open up, they're not open up yet. So I think California takes uh, longer than I expected yeah. uh, to open up. And when this uh, hit us in, in March, we thought, hey, maybe we'll do a roadshow in the Bay Area in late April or in, in May. So <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to happen in uh, uh, this September. Uh, and so I understand why investors are not as active. We look at that as an opportunity. And I think there are uh, investors out there that have recently raised money and that will be active right now. Um, not sure the valuations will be as attractive as they used to be. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think my advice for founders right now that have to raise or that get an offer that is fair, I'm not saying like predatory offers, but uh, like a fair offer from a VC, take it, take the money and run. Yeah. Uh, because you, know, you don't know, like, and you wanna build things now, you want to get to traction. So if you have even like on solid terms or a safe note that you can raise from friends and family around you 
so you could hit the business milestones and get to 2021, do it. Uh, but don't spend a lot of time right now on trying to raise money. Uh, I'm not sure it's a smart, you know, uh, uh, it's a smart move if you're an early stage founder right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, it's uh, several interesting times. Uh, I mean, it's probably not bad for the ecosystem though, forcing everyone to be like, look, you actually have to have a business model that works. You can't just take a bunch of capital and grow and then figure it out later. Like, it might be a decent uh, resetting for, uh, for everyone. Um, but yeah, it's a cliche that all of the, the successful companies we see these days were founded uh, in times of uncertainty and, and during the last, uh, uh, no, the last uh, recession, but, uh, but it's also true. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. Uh, but but what's, what's, what's scary is that it could be uh, a year process, but it could be also two, three years of, of a, a long process. And, and in the meanwhile, maybe technology here is a solution. And if you have the capital, you can build things uh, or you have the, the time and the ability uh, to, to build something new. Uh, but a lot of businesses will, uh, will get uh, for, foreclosed uh, this year. Mm -hmm. um, no, I have a family that were uh, members that were in the hospitality businesses in, in the business and that pretty much shut down for, for the year and that millions of people are going to lose their jobs yeah. in the coming month. Um, uh, so it's, uh, like it's, it's, it's scary also in, a, in the grand scheme of things and sad, uh, but hopefully it's, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, long, uh, long term, it's an opportunity to build something new, uh, if you can do that. Yeah. I think you have to look at the silver linings, uh, when stuff like this is going on, if not, you'll end up going crazy. So, um, no, definitely legitimate. So, um, let's let's jump back to teams so we put a lot of importance on teams especially in early stage ventures because we're betting on them uh from the standpoint of like the idea that you show me at a very early stage there's there's no way it's going to be the same thing in like four or five years it, everything always changes whether it's slightly or a lot um so we bet on founders specifically uh, to be able to see those changes through so um because team is so important like what are some of the issues that you end up seeing with co-founders and just in general around it, especially at the early stage? So the, the truth is, is that I think, uh, you know, companies don't get uh, in the early stage. Uh, and we have a few companies that uh, in the last three years had to uh, um, close, shut down the operation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's typically because of founding team uh, issues. It's not about product market fit typically or a bad idea. Uh, no, it could be part of the execution, sure, but, but things go south and the decision to end the business, it's typically because founders uh, got into a point that they don't see uh, eye to eye um, and wasn't maybe a good fit and uh, and, um, and I think a way to avoid that um, is kind of align expectations early on. Yeah. Uh, in many, and, and I'm not saying that you can plan two years in, in advance, but uh, you should have in place uh, a napkin agreement or one page agreement. A founder's agreement is very important. Yeah. And teams that didn't have that, or that it was not clear the who's this really the CEO and who's really the CTO or the or the chief product and there's like uh, even in small two three teams that you know there's eventually one decision makers on the business stuff and one decision maker on that when things are unclear uh, in terms of roles uh, it's not healthy for for the business you said uh, you, you told me something. I recently saw a company that, you know, there are uh, th three team members and I saw on the deck, it was two co-CEOs. And I saw that and I said, no guys, it's uh that's a big no, no. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you know, you can have two co-CEOs when you're running a, uh, you know, a, uh, who who has that? Oracle has two. Yeah. Uh, when you're, you're uh, 
<laughs> Fortune 10. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but not when you like four, uh, uh, four guys. So, uh, but sometimes it's not as clear on the deck, but you understand that uh, uh, there's need to be like clear, clear role uh, definition here. Um, yeah, and a line of expectation is also personally, I think. Uh, something that I ask, um, and that's part of our application is guys, how much, you know, personal runway do you have? Yeah. Uh, and I think being open about that, uh, especially when founding team members might have a family, a significant other, uh, you know, other people to feed, yeah. uh, building a business, uh, in a way, building a startup. Many times I think about that. It's, it's a privilege. Yeah. Uh, that you'd be able to be an independent and build something like that. And, and founding team members need to acknowledge the needs. And I'm not saying you cannot do that. Of course, we have, we have a family, we have a CEO, a female entrepreneur that moved here uh, with uh, three children to Los Angeles and raised a seed round. And it's a tough relocation here. And we have other founders that came by themselves to, to California. Um, so it's never easy. Uh, yeah. but, but the other team members should be uh supportive of that uh in and understand the different needs uh uh and and i think having those conversations about commitment and personal runway between the founding team members uh is important and also having plan b in case in six months hey you want to continue doing that and i'm going to continue to do something else yeah. and there are mechanisms to do that yeah. in terms of cliff investing uh and and you can do that in a fair way um and not crushing the the company in terms of that equity and stuff like that yeah. uh, so those are things uh that worthwhile thinking of and i know you've been involved with a founders initiative uh at, at usc so i don't know maybe you can share like no there's there's a lot of data about that and i think founders uh agreement or having that line of expectation is, is important. I don't know. What's your take? Uh, uh, no, honestly, a hundred percent. I don't think that, uh, I don't think enough investors put enough, in, en enough impetus on the, uh, on the founding team and their, and the, the, the many dynamics that are associated with it. Um, roles is one of the biggest things. And it's something that I, that I'll, that I always dive into, um, with them specifically, like, especially when we're doing like pre seed -pre rounds, it's like, okay, who is the CEO? Can you fire the CTO? Like, that's one of my favorite questions. Like, is that, is that something that's plausible? Have you set up the hierarchy enough? Like, is this, has this actually been done? One of my other favorite questions is the, uh, how did you split equity? Um, because that's where a lot of the time you end up running into a lot of contentious uh, discussions in that, uh, maybe the engineer is doing a lot of work in the beginning and then the business person is going to be doing a lot of work in kind of the second quarter um, and going forward. But there becomes a lot of disparities on what people value and what they think that they're actually worth and uh, how you actually decided, like, did you, did you have that tough conversation around, uh, around equity? Did you actually have a conversation about it or did you just split 50-50? Like, that's one of the things that I hate the most is like, we split it 50-50. It's like, okay, what you're communicating to me is that you guys did not have a conversation about this. And instead of having that tough one now and getting it out of the way, um, you're going to run into this going forward in six months, a year, I don't know when, but there's a ticking time bomb sitting in your startup that you don't, that you haven't uh, yet dealt, dealt with. Um, so that's another one of my, uh, my big ones, but now roles, roles and hierarchy are, are very, very important because it's, it's in the beginning when you're first starting out, like it's very flat and making, it, making that transition to uh, the hierarchy is if you haven't set out the right guidelines and the right expectations in the beginning, like it becomes very difficult to, to be able to do that because other people have made assumptions that maybe you haven't. So no, I a hundred percent agree. Uh, and you need to be conscious that maybe down the road, uh, uh, you've started uh, uh, two people in the team and then down the road you, you, you understand that you need a third person or fourth person to complement what, yeah. what you're missing. Uh, and I'm in favor of, of, of doing it in a strategic way and allocate to that extra co-founder uh, equity 
yeah. uh, and, and do that in a smart way, but don't be afraid of having that conversation. Uh, and also acknowledge that sometimes uh, something is missing in the core team and you want to bring an extra co-founder, even if it's a year later. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes those are hard conversations to have. No, that's true. I really like your question about uh, personal runway, though. Uh, no, it's hard to ask that, but uh, <laughs> I, I have to, you have to ask that. Like, what's, no. I mean, it's, it's good. How long it's, until you're going to look for another job? Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know. It must be tough getting like real answers from them on that one. Like, no, I'm committed 100 percent or forever until this. You take the answer, you cut it by 50. <laughs> <laughs> At least 30 percent less. It's like revenue. <laughs> What's your projection for this year? You take the answer, divide it by two. Yeah. <laughs> and being optimistic. Like, there we go. Okay, now I understand. <laughs> We need to be optimistic in our line of business, that's for sure. It's very true. I, I do love looking at uh, projections and being like, the only thing I can tell you about this projection is that I know it's wrong. Like, that's the only thing I can tell you. <laughs> I want you to look, be realistic, and I want you to be, uh, achieve that. And I don't want, actually, sometimes Israeli founders might put very conservative, they're like hard on themselves, and they're putting very conservative assessments. And that's maybe something a bit different than uh, maybe uh, American founders that will put oh, very yeah. <laughs> positive. So I see Jager. that and I'm actually kind of like afraid. Guys, you need to, you need to <laughs> put forward uh, on the projections here. Not everybody, but sometimes I see that and it's not, also not helpful. <laughs> oh yeah, honestly, because if it's not, uh, it's not the same in the market. And if I'm looking at it, looking at uh, ridiculous projections all the time, when I see one that's not, I'm like, wait, hold on. Like, <laughs> going on here <laughs> I'm, I'm confused yeah. but in fact the truth is in our application process we don't ask for a business plan no it's good yeah and we do, like sometimes we'll look at a spreadsheet but it's not a mandatory to have uh you know uh, we don't those 30 30 uh, page uh uh you know you can read it, it's a nice fiction but it's not really, <laughs> uh but uh, no a, a solid deck 10 slides uh should do the work. Yeah, I agree, hundred uh, percent. I don't think I've ever asked for financials on that on that standpoint um, prediction. So <laughs> awesome, um, cool. So let's. Uh, so we are in weird times, but like, what what are some of the startups that are getting you excited? Like right now, like is it uh, is it your DTC? Is it your gaming companies? Like what what kind of space are you uh, like more interested in right? So I think there's an opportunity right now, of course, anything and everything uh, remote uh, uh, is, uh, is, has an opportunity. Uh, we've invested in a, in a few uh, ventures in the HR future of workspace uh, in terms mm -hmm. of recruitment uh, and how to automa auto automate and um, that process and make it uh, make it better for companies. I think that's exciting. Uh, we're investing in a company that is all about productivity of tools and time uh, for organizations. And I think that that is huge uh, in terms of wellness. So we're not going to do uh, like uh, medical device where it's too capital int intensive for us, but we think there's an opportunity for disruption in the wellness uh, and healthcare space mm -hmm. uh, that is changing and there's going to be more investment in that. Uh, so, um, we've done deals in, uh, uh, wellness for senior citizens. Uh, we've done deals for mental health, uh, collaboration. We're looking at deals and kind of like telehealth, uh, healthcare IT, um, uh, a recent direct to consumer app, uh, we've invested in is, uh, called giant leap. It's about targeting. Um, assessment for um, it's targeting parents and helps parents uh, uh, with a game, a, uh, a child development tool to help them assess their children age three to eight and kind of like understand their, uh, their brain in, in, in uh, what things they could do in order to, be, to help their kids become better in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are things that you can do uh, from home, 
Uh, we have an e-learning company uh, that we're excited about. So uh, a lot of the, you know, the old school industries, um, um, you know, are changing. You do a lot of work from home. So those are the things that we're, we're looking at. Um, yeah, and of course, the gaming company is always great to see that the people at home, yeah. uh, so they have more time to uh, to play. And uh, uh, we've done both deals in uh, uh, mobile, uh, kind of like casual games. But one of our latest investments um, is a company that does like mid-core strategy uh, game, and they're launching the multiplayer version right now. Um, so uh, nice. You know, we're betting for them to be the next Epic Games. Right. Uh, but, uh, but no, but we're, but we're looking, we're looking at that, and I think LA is definitely one of the best markets in the world to launch a B two C direct to consumer app product service. Mm -hmm. But even the ecosystem around that. Um, another investment we've done it's a customer service automation. Sounds very, you know something that uh, you should have uh, yeah. and kind of like a plug-in, but it's not. It's uh, unless you're a big company today um, and then you can have that dedicated customer automation team, uh, having that for a business that is growing or, or for a business that just had to move uh, online, uh, it's difficult in companies that provide that set of services in terms of customer support, uh, cloud services, um is is uh, those are great solutions for that so uh, it's all over this the space here uh the things that we're interested in uh eventually i'll go back to the beginning we're looking for a strong dedicated team that is looking to build something big and and they need to educate us yeah. they need to tell me yeah here this is an opportunity that gonna change and things in five years people will need what we're building right now yeah. And in 10 years, it's going to be something big. Um, so we don't have the ideas. We're just investors. Uh, but we're, you know, we're, 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 we, we think we can identify good people uh, and, and people that we can maybe be helpful from our network. So I want founders to reach out to me with crazy ideas, but that have done their research and, and kind of like educate me on, on an angle, on an industry that, uh, that I didn't hear about. Nice. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, Yair, where can, uh, where can people find you? Uh, Yair at fusionlabs.la. Oh, uh, cool. Our Dangerous. website, fusionlabs.la. Uh, 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 just like we have the best thing if you're a founder is just fill out the application form and you'll get a quick answer from us in 72 hours uh, in terms of uh, maybe scheduling a first call or if maybe it's relevant or not relevant, but feel free to reach out. And, and, and uh, we're trying not to leave any founder uh, without a, an answer. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to come on the show and uh, look forward to chatting. Thank you. Anytime.